what I would encourage both scholars and people in our churches to do is to think about why some of these laws exist. Dynamic biblical discussions with special guests exploring tough biblical issues, academic scholarship, ethics, archaeology, textual criticism, Old Testament, New Testament, Bible interpretation, apocalyptic literature, Christian history, ancient Near East cultures. You're tuned in to Conversations with Pastor Cliff on Poluso Ministries. Good day, everybody. Welcome back to another episode on Conversations with Pastor Cliff. And today my guest is Cheryl Anderson, and she is a former practicing lawyer, and she has a PhD in Biblical Studies. And um, our topic for today will be talking about the ethical impact of Biblical interpretation. Cheryl, welcome to Pulisar Ministries on Conversations with Pastor Cliff. Oh, thank you. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you. I know you and I are going to have an awesome conversation about the ethical impact of biblical interpretation. Perhaps before we dive right into it, if you can familiarize our audience as to you know who you are and what has gotten you involved in what you are currently doing and uh, you know in biblical studies. Well, I um am a seminary professor uh, at this time, and I have been for quite a few years. And uh, as you mentioned in my first career, I was a practicing attorney in Washington, DC. And my transition from being a lawyer into becoming a biblical scholar um, was helped by my research, uh, my focusing on research on biblical laws. So that was the transition. And when I was looking at these biblical laws, I realized that many people in our churches don't really know what's in these laws. And um, th that can be problematic because these laws have things that 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 may not be helpful today, may not be constructive today, and can actually be damaging today. They they raise questions that we don't often consider. For example, um, there's a law concerning gleaning, where those who own fields are, when they harvest, are to leave the uh, some in the field for those who do not have to to take so that they have food well i would want people to begin to question well how effective is that in providing food for those who do not have it what do they do when it's not harvest season so i would want people to begin to ask these kinds of questions of the text rather than just accept them or ignore them Okay, uh, that's very interesting, Asho. You know, um, many of us come from you know different backgrounds where you know our church traditions or whatever religious tradition one may find themselves. You know, where people would, would have been reading these laws um, in in the biblical text itself, and you know, for the modern day reader today, they may look at these laws and feel maybe they are slightly outdated, or maybe they may look at them as something that is more irrelevant for their time. And how would you? And I address that in you know to a modern day reader who is you know con confronted with these laws in the biblical text. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's a, a a very very good question. Uh, I would encourage people of faith, and I am a person of faith. I'm I'm United Methodist, and I'm also ordained, and I have in fact pastored myself um, uh, before going back to school for my uh, uh, PhD. And so what I would encourage both scholars and people in our churches to do is to think about why some of these laws exist. Uh, I would not want people to ignore them. I, I think ignoring them would would eliminate our possibility to rethink what the Bible is and to rethink how we interpret biblical text. So I think we need to, to deal with everything in, in the Bible, but, but to evaluate it. And it's the evaluative 
process that I hope we'll get to talk a little bit more about. Um, but to but I would I would encourage a two step process. One would be to try to ask why these laws might be there. What what purpose might they have served in ancient Israel? The other part to consider is what might that text mean for us today? And I'll give you an example of Deuteronomy 22, verse 9, which says, you shall not sow your vineyard with a second kind of seed. I mean, and it seems kind of obscure today. I mean, why, why, I mean, that law had some purpose in ancient Israel, but what might it mean for us today? And that's a different question yeah. and one that I would like for us to engage. And I think that uh, a prohibition against mixing seeds of different kinds might pertain to um, uh, 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 genetic modification of seeds today that, that we do. Um, so these laws can get us to ask new questions, different questions about how they apply in our lives today. And I and to me, that's very exciting. Yeah, I, I know, Bob, so, you know, when one reads these texts today, we are looking at a very ancient text and some people, you know, esteem the Bible as, you know, the absolute authoritarian word of God, maybe in, 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 the, in that aspect. And they would maybe tend to view some of these laws as, you know, cast in stone that you cannot temper with. But now I want you to maybe point out some of the problematic um, text, I mean, laws in not looking at these laws, how we can maybe make them relevant for our time. You know, you mentioned just now, you know, Deuteronomy 22, um, and there are some other texts that are mainly problematic in the text itself. And, you know, one that I can think of from the top of my head is, you know, when you get into the land um, of Canaan, you need to, you know, uh, clean up the land and, you know, kill people. And, you know, even their children, you need to, to kill. How would one now look yeah, at Leave nothing that breathes. Yeah, leave yeah. nothing <laughs> that breathes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> how would That's you handle right. that? Yeah, how would you speak to that? Yeah. Um, for a problematic text like that, one important thing to know is that these texts were not written when they appear to have been written. And these that particular kind of text is probably written in a post-exilic period about a group that had been away from the land going back to the land then and trying to not only go back, but to also reclaim leadership positions. <laughs> and so, <laughs> so they are the, the groups that they talk about that they list didn't even exist in the first wow. history. So, so um, they um, are are really talking about a very particular kind of of uh, historical moment with a particular purpose in mind. What I think the 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 takeaway, the 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 final point that I would want people to know about a problematic text like that is that there are also other biblical texts that give you a very different look at how you treat people who are different. Because that's basically what's at stake. Yeah. How, how do we treat people who are different? And we have a text, you know, such as the text in Deuteronomy about annihilation of, of groups, but we also have the story of Ruth, mm -hmm. who is different. And in yeah. fact, there's a law that says no Moabite or Ammonite shall ever join, you know, the assembly. So we have texts that are in conversation. Yeah. With a, 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 te a text like that one in Deuteronomy. And, and that's what I would hope people would begin to see is how to take a broader view rather than the narrow view of this is the law in Deuteronomy, so it must be okay if we kill our enemies or, or those that we think are different. But there's Ruth who actually is 
an ancestor of David, you know, the glory of King David. So, so um, I, I would hope that people would begin to see the Bible in a, in a different, broader perspective, that these texts do, in fact, pre present a, a broader view of how we treat people. Okay, that's, that's interesting. So um, now I know many of us have done theology and some 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 of our viewers maybe may be doing theology and not realizing that a lot of theology has been handed down or commentaries for, for that matter that are written about the Bible are coming predominantly from one perspective, I would say. And uh, you mentioned a lot of inclusive uh, you know, Bible interpretation um, in, in, in the reading of text, why do you push that, uh, that, that line and what, what is the importance of it in reading the scripture as something that is more inclusive to accommodate other people's perspectives? By inclusive biblical interpretation, I mean interpretation that includes a variety of perspectives. Uh, and these are perspectives that usually aren't included. The perspective of women, people who um, are outside of the, the dominant, you know, white um, heteronormative culture um, and um, uh, the poor. So, and, and I came to that as being an important aspect of my work when I was teaching a group of secondary school seniors. These were young people who were going to start university the next year. And I had been told to teach them the kind of information that I teach my students in seminary. Mm -hmm. and so I was getting them to question some of what they had been told. For instance, I was mentioning to them that the Ten Commandments accepts slavery. Mm -hmm. I mentioned that a story like Genesis 19 uh, basically says that it's better to rape a woman than a man. And there was one African-American female in this group who was was not accepting this information at all. And she held up the Bible and she said, this is the word of God. If it says rape is okay, rape is okay. If it says slavery is okay, slavery is okay. And I realized that she had been taught that to be a person of faith, to be a Christian meant that she couldn't have any questions about the Bible and what it says about either women or how it's been used against African Americans in the United States. So to hear a black teenager say slavery was okay, that to me just showed me how uh, it was appalling, first of all, and then secondly, it shows how we def definitely need to bring these perspectives um, to bear when we're engaging biblical texts. So out of that, I talk about in my work, not only inclusive biblical interpretation where we can bring who we are to our reading of the text, I'm pushing it even further. And I'm saying that we um, must have ethical biblical interpretation and ethical biblical interpretation takes into account both the kind of exegetical work that we do in graduate programs in looking at um, the background of a biblical text, but we must also engage the contemporary consequences of biblical interpretation. And it is not ethical to only do one and not the other. All right, I see. I, I know, Shell, you've done a lot of work in, in South Africa, you know, engaging a lot of uh, scholars and theologians from here. And you've written a lot of work in the field of uh, you know, HIV and AIDS. And how do you then ascertain or, or even gauge how certain texts may have been used in an unethical way? Um, you know, these are biblical texts. And, you know, we know a lot of may, maybe our people down here in South Africa would be uh, following specific readings of texts. And some of those texts in terms of how, you know, HIV and AIDS has impacted us in South Africa 
what was your take, you know, from a theological reading, and how do you apply that to to ensure that maybe we have ethical, you know, biblical interpretation of some of these texts that we encounter. Mm-hmm. Um, I have learned a tremendous amount from South African scholars. In fact, I'm the scholar I am, and I do the kind of work I do because of what I've learned from them. And um, over a period of probably eight years, I I was um, uh, a visiting scholar at the University of KwaZulu-Natal in in Peter Maritzburg. And um, uh, from them, I, I learned how to do contextual Bible study in in that context. And and what I learned about doing contextual Bible study there is that it becomes a way of bringing our contemporary realities into our reading of the biblical text. So I, at the time I was thinking about it sort of intellectually that we needed to be inclusive. Contextual Bible study gave me an actual process by which that could happen. And uh, one of the studies, um, uh, for instance, um, had to do with the story of David's daughter, uh, Tamar, in, in 2 Samuel. And it is a story of a rape. Um, and in, in when we often read that story, it's part of the succession narrative. The emphasis is on, on how Solomon becomes king and how the, the internal wars <laughs> that, are, that are waged against David. So it, it becomes a story of, of the men rather than her story and her story and how she is victimized within her own family. Well, by seeing that story and reading that story with my colleagues in South Africa, I learned how it can be a way of looking at the dynamics that support violence against women in our culture. So it takes on a whole new meaning. It's no longer just a part of this, of Solomon's succession narrative, it actually is something that helps us engage part of our, our, our reality today. Fantastic. Um, what is interesting to me, you mentioned something about a mythical norm, and we also mentioned it in your book. And, and tell me, what, what do you mean by this term, a mythical norm? Um, you know, I would assume that, uh, as I said earlier, that we, we tend to read texts that are you know handed down from us from a particular point of view and they actually get embodied in a particular author authority or a voice that maybe may not necessarily represent other voices like maybe like myself and yourself and and the other minority groups that may be reading the book of text and i just wanted to clarify if i'm actually hearing or understanding this mythical term correctly and maybe it may also benefit some of our audience mm-hmm. Um, I use the term, um, the mythical norm from the work of Audre Lorde, and she defines it as what we think of as a sort of typical or normal human being, but that typical normal human being doesn't look like either of us. It's someone (laughs) who who is white, privileged, um, and, um, uh, you know, uh, heterosexual and, and cisgender. And, and it's that perspective. It's, it's, it's primarily a white perspective. And in fact, um, the term didn't exist when I was writing that book, but but the term that is being used now is whiteness, where whiteness is a kind of dynamic. It's a kind of, of, of perspective that is open to anyone. It has nothing to do with actually having a certain kind of embodiment. It, it has to do with a kind of outlook on the world. And that whiteness uh, has shaped how we read the Bible Mm -hmm. because most of the interpretations that we are familiar with have been shaped from that perspective. And it's not that the Bible can't yield other readings. 
yeah. as, as the example I gave you of, of the story of Tamar. It, it, it can have other readings, but they are not the ones that are often taught in our churches because yeah. they we, we, we assume there's only one reading. And one of the things that I learned from doing contextual Bible study is that a text can have multiple meanings. Yeah. And that, and that it 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 is in opening up the text in these ways that to me we actually are are um, in in engaging the Bible in the most authentic way because the Bible itself reinterprets reinterprets itself so that, <laughs> so the the bible itself is giving us permission to do that we just normally don't think that we normally think okay we find one verse that pertains to something and that is the christian perspective yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but in fact um as i gave you that example with looking at the story of ruth the, the bible has multiple perspectives and and it it reinterprets itself it's in conversation with itself and so we need to be able to bring that um multiplicity to our everyday reading of of the biblical texts to ensure that we keep bringing you tough conversations like these, please support our ministry by donating as little as 50 Rand per month. You can find our banking details on our website, pulusoministries.co.za. Now, you, you point something out, you know, that the Bible interprets itself and there are plenty of, of perspectives within the Bible itself. And this may not be as clear as possible to maybe a lot of our viewers, you know, as you and I would know, that a lot of biblical texts were, you know, traditions that were handed down orally and got modified and reinterpreted as time went by. So there was never a time where a particular reading was solidified. You know, different generations would read them differently. And do you perhaps have, have a, an example where we have this shift in perspective in, in, in the biblical text itself? where we see maybe the older generation as views being changed by your modern maybe readers within the Bible itself. Do you have something like that? Yes, there's an example that uh, I, I like to use because it's just so clear. It is um, Exodus chapter 20 and um, verse four in particular, but Exodus chapter 20 is um, the giving of the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, and uh, right after the the law, you shall not make for yourself an idol. It goes. God goes on to say, uh, punishing children for the iniquity of parents to the third and fourth generation, and so that idea of vicarious punishment, that idea of punishing subsequent generations. Um, is an, an important concept at that moment because it's to underscore the importance of observing the Ten Commandments. Mm -hmm. But we find in Ezekiel chapter 18, um, uh, language that I, that I just love, and it's what God is saying, what do you mean by repeating the proverb, the parents have eaten sour grapes and the children's <laughs> teeth are set on edge? I mean, yeah. it's why would you think that the children are impacted by what the parents have done? Yeah. Uh, but it's, and it, you, you know, you could see somebody saying, but you told us in Exodus 20 that, <laughs> <laughs> that this would happen. Yeah. But so it totally contradicts Exodus chapter 20, verse four. But what I teach my students is that you need to consider the context in which this word was given. In, in Exodus, it was important to underscore the, the Ten Commandments and the giving of, of the, the Decalogue at that time. In e Ezekiel, the message has to be different because the people are sitting in exile at that yeah. point. And if they are going to be punished for what their parents have done, they will be there forever. And they aren't. They do go back to the land at some point. So at that point, that principle of vicarious punishment would have been har a harmful message. And so it's important to consider what would be the message of a loving God at that moment. For Exodus, it was to say, these are important, you need to observe them, or there will be 
vicarious punishment. That's not a loving message when they are in exile. And so it's the opposite of mm -hmm. what been told earlier. And that's that kind of reworking of traditions and understandings of, 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 of God and our relationship with God over a period of time. Okay, that that's a very good example. Um, and tell me, I, I think a lot of our, our viewers are also maybe, I don't know, from a Christian background, I assume, but some may not. Um, and you may be reading Jesus and Paul, and to you, what what uh, sort of patterns do emerge when we look at the, the Jesus as a reading of his own text? I mean, I would assume he was a, a student of the Hebrew Bible. He would have understood uh, his own you know, tradition. But at some point, I sense that he, you know, he changes some things. I mean, he when he talks on the Sermon on, on the Mount, he says, you've had, you know, but I say, you know, you've had, but I say. So what I'm essentially asking you is what patterns do emerge when you look at the person of Jesus and, and also Paul, who was also a, a, a Pharisee, I mean, a student in the Hebrew Bible as well. What patterns do you get from there? Yes, I did see very clear patterns. And, and I, would, I, I suggest that, that, that their pattern, the pattern of Jesus and Paul, can be our pattern in engaging our biblical texts and applying them and reconsidering them in our period. And I noticed that there were four things in particular uh, that uh, they both considered the impact of an interpretation on the marginalized. And that's really very important because I think all too often we're uh, we're too likely to say, well, I'm sorry that interpretation hurts you, but that's the word of God. But no, Jesus each each time would see the impact on the marginalization, on the marginalized, yeah. and in fact say that that uh, could change. Then the interpretation was always um, grounded in the biblical text itself. And because the Bible does have these differing traditions that are in conversation, it is possible to find another tradition in the Bible that um, is supportive of being more inclusive and working to incorporate those who had been formally excluded. And then both of them always identified the absolute requirement of God, which we know is to love God and, and to love our neighbors as ourselves. And then finally, both Jesus and Paul worked to include those who had been ex excluded. With Jesus, it was those primarily within his own community. And with Paul, of course, it was to include the Gentiles. So, but both of them did that. They, they, they within their own traditions, they were able to both include and expand those who were, um, uh, and, and to include those who had formerly been excluded. Okay, fantastic. And and Cheryl, maybe if I touch on on people like uh, the reformers like Luther and them, um, do you think they they used uh, their reading of, of of the text or text uh, for their time to try and, and apply them at their time and make them maybe something that is slightly applicable for them and the people who were maybe reading their work at their time? Is that, is that what you, you're gathering as well? Um, yes, in, in my work, I looked at um, Luther and Calvin and Wesley, and um, I saw that just as I knew the the Bible to be a dynamic document that reinterprets itself over time. I saw that these, uh, the, th the three great you know, Protestant reformers, that they did the same thing. There's never a point in time where uh, they say, oh, the earlier tradition understood grace or works in that way and so for and the, therefore i must accept them in the same way <laughs> each <laughs> each reformer took what had come before and then adjusted for their own time and place and so i want the kind of dynamic 
uh, tendencies and and processes that I see happening within the Bible itself, they also happened within our Protestant history. They it keeps getting reinterpreted, and I was able to identify particular principles that would be very helpful for us as we try to engage both. Um, human, our, our lives of faith, even as human being to human being. And then of course, the, the big issue now, human beings and and the earth, uh, yeah. because we realize that we haven't done that relationship very well. So, so <laughs> there are ways that, that, that the Protestant reformers themselves can take on new meaning as we face these new challenges. I see, um, I, I think something that is striking from our conversation, Cheryl, is that, you know, we cannot be content about what the former readers have, you know, have you know, gleaned from the text itself to apply it to their context in that time. So each reader, as to what I'm saying, I'm hearing you say, is that they have their own unique context in which they find themselves. And therefore, every time one reads the text, they're always going to have to interpret the text and obviously apply it. To, to to their context in, as to what it would mean for them. Am I right in 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 hearing that emphasis that you're putting on this you know contextual you know biblical interpretation? Uh, yes, I do. <laughs> One of my students said in class recently that she was telling her mother you know the kinds of things she was learning about the bible in the introduction to hebrew bible course and her mother said well how do uh just ordinary simple people read <laughs> read the bible <laughs> <laughs> and so i i want to make it very clear that i'm not taking away anyone's devotional use of the bible i, I i'm not um but in the united states the the crisis that we have now is that people are using their devotional reading of the Bible and imposing it on others. Oh, and yeah. that's, I have a problem. At that point, that is, uh, uh, it's a problem and it's unethical because what I, I'm saying is that you need, with ethical biblical interpretation, it is taking the historical critical information about the text into account, but it's also taking into account the impact on these marginalized groups that normally are not at the table when people are thinking of what the Christian perspective is. That one Christian perspective is usually from the dominant culture and all too often they aren't the ones in fact suffering the consequences of those interpretations. So yes, I would in, in the public arena, I would very much like to see ethical interpretation that takes both things into account. The, the, um, the background information and the consequences of any one particular biblical text. Fantastic. I think um, our time is running out. But before I let you go, I would like to ask you this last question, you know, and it pertaining to your book. What is that one thing maybe as an overarching maybe theme or a takeaway that you would want our readers um, to, you know, to to glean from your book? Uh, if that's, there is one thing in particular that you'd want to, them to take away from your book, what, what would be that thing? Um, to answer that question, I have to uh, mention uh, something that I do with my students at the beginning of the course and of my intro to Hebrew Bible course. It's, it's the course that I teach every year. So <laughs> it's the one that I, it's my default setting when I go to anything. Um, and, and that is, I ask them in the very first class to talk about their community or their people. And I tell them, they go around the class and I say that, and I say, you never interpret the Bible in a way that will hurt your community. Yeah, and That's what I would want people to take away from this interview is think about how often we read the Bible and, and we don't bring who we are and the people who have shaped us, who have supported us. And we actually are taught to read the Bible in ways that can hurt Mm. Our own people. And we should never do that. We should always think of how we can interpret the Bible so that those perspectives 
those realities can be included in our understanding of what the Bible means. Oh, thank you, um, Cheryl. That has, it's been fantastic to have you on the show. And uh, I think as a last, do you perhaps do you have any work that you're working on in the background? And uh, how do some of our audience uh, you know, get hold of your work that you've published already? I know you are on some of the leading uh, book uh, resellers. And where else could they get hold of uh, some of the work that you are currently working on or have published already? Um, I'm still working on that, uh, of getting things uh, digitally available to people <laughs> so, that, so that you don't have to be in the United States to get a hold of it. Right now, uh, or within the next year, I hope to pull together the work that I'm doing on interpreting the Bible in the context of HIV and AIDS, um, because that was the reason I started going to UKZN in the first place. And it's high time that I get yeah. that pulled together and uh, to make that available. Um, so I'm I'm still uh, producing work, but it's at this point I don't have a website that that has it readily available. So I'll have to work on that. <laughs> well, it's work in progress, and we, you know, once it's out there, perhaps we'll bring you back onto the show and we can chat more about it later. Yeah. Oh, I, I would like that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Ashel, and um, for, for making the time to come to chat to us on Pulisson Ministries. It's certainly been good. And to our viewers, I certainly hope you've enjoyed this interview. And if you have not yet subscribed, please uh, con consider subscribing and liking us so that you can get information as we publish it onto our YouTube channel and our other social media sites. Thank you very much for watching and stay blessed. And until next time, God bless you. Goodbye. Puloso Ministries is a non-profit educational enterprise founded in 2019. The ministry is informed by academic scholarship. At Puloso, we embrace multiple perspectives in our engagement with scripture. We seek to provide non-Christians and Christians from all backgrounds and denominations with resources that provide an honest intellectual engagement with the Bible. We embrace multiple perspectives in fostering a more open, moderate society into the 21st century and beyond. To ensure that we keep bringing you tough conversations like these, please support our ministry by donating as little as 50 Rand per month. You can find our banking details on our website, pulusoministries.co.za.